Well, uh, when Chris and I were first married, we had the opportunity where we were going to have the chance that we were going to build our own home. It was a special time, and over the course of a year, we put a lot of sweat and tears into that home. It was a special time for us, but one of the things that we learned along the way was how important the foundation was, and I think this is for two reasons. One of them is because when you hear that you're going to build a home and you get started on that, there's a long time between when you actually say, let's build it, and you actually see some movement, because the first thing that you see done is you see something looks like this. The foundation is in, and you get so excited. But there's another part of why the foundation is so important. It's because it is the most important part of the house because everything else rises and falls on this. If it's off by just a little bit, everything else can crumble under the weight of the problem there. And this is actually Ed's house. He was building this house in 2016. And when you get to this part, you have so much hope because it's starting to move. Unless, of course, you find out that there's something wrong with the foundation, which is exactly what happened to this home. In fact, there was a section right over here that was too short. By one foot, it was simply too short. And then you see what you never want to see around your building site. You see an excavator, not there when they're moving dirt, but when they're trying to tear out what you've already done. This is not good. You can see that you have the special saw, you've got to cut it all up, and the excavator comes in, and it starts to tear everything apart. You never, ever want to see this. But let me tell you something worse than seeing this. When you go ahead and build it anyway, and then you find the problems are there. Today, we want to talk about what's the foundation of our faith. We want to come back to the baseline of it all. What is it that is the foundation of everything we do, where everything rises and falls on whether or not we have this correct? I'm going to give you a, a simple term. It's a term you won't hear anywhere other than churches. So I like to make sure that maybe you're not from a church background, that we give you some understanding. If we use a word that's not common other places, that you would have some understanding of what it means. And this is a word called the gospel. And the gospel quite simply means good news or good story. It's good. The, this, the, this first part means the good. This actually is like for spell. is the good news. And here's the good news, is that God has the power to save us from our sins. That is the good news. That is the foundation. And everything about our faith in Jesus Christ rises and falls based on this. And as we go through uh, Colossians today, we're in Colossians 2, I really want you to center down on this. That everything you see in this, he's going to give us some cautions on what will happen if you do not fall in line with this premise. In fact, throughout the entire chapter, he continues to bring this idea up. But he also gives us some cautions so he, first he starts off by saying this is, a, this is the foundation. Look what it says here. We're going to start in verse chapter 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your life in him. Remember this idea? It's the foundation. It begins when you received Christ. Continue to live in him. Rooted. Here, right here you see that premise of a foundation. Built up in him. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught. And overflowing with thankfulness overflowing with thankfulness because we have this foundation. But as he goes on, we find that there's also some problems, some cautions that he's seeing inside the church. Now, I need you to know something. This is a book out of the Bible that's written by a guy who's in prison. His name's Paul. He's one of the founders of so many churches across the Mediterranean at the time. He actually did not, uh, was not the founder of this church, but he writes them a letter to tell them some key issues that they're going to face and how to make sure everything is locked into the foundation to the core. He says, this is where you're going to have trouble. And I want you to realize something. The cautions he gives to them were not written to you. They were not written to South Umqua. They were not written to Sutherland or the Green Campus. They were written to Colossians. They were written to a city named Colossae 2,000 years ago. It was to them. But it was written for us. It was preserved, and God put it inside the Bible so that 2,000 years later, the wisdom from this text we can still hold on to today. So hear this. This is so critical. It wasn't written to you, but it was written for you. And so I want us to glean some things. And this is the most important part, that the foundation of our faith is the gospel. But if you've ever seen houses that don't make it, Oftentimes you find it's because they have problems along the way and the foundation is not strong enough to hold it in place. I don't know if you, maybe you grew up in church, but I learned a lot about building from Sunday school. 
Not because they were necessarily just teaching me about the Bible, but also because we sang songs like, the wise man built his house upon the rock. And then you hear about the foolish man who built it on the sand. And in the end, a storm comes, and you find out that one of them, with all of his wisdom, his house stands firm, and the other one ends up living in his parents' basement until he's like 45 years old. Because the foundation is so critical. Now I want you to go on. As we go on with this, I want you to start listening to the cautions, and I want you to continually think back. What is our foundation? So the first one comes, uh, we see this uh, in verse 8. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies, which depend on human tradition. Basically saying, there are ways of thinking that will lead you astray. The foundation is Jesus, and they will try and undercut this. Be careful of these philosophies. And so I want you to write that down on your outline. I think that's the second blank there. It says deceptive philosophies. R write that in. At the time, remember, remember this book was written to the Colossians. At the time, their biggest philosophic problem was centered around who Jesus was, but it was totally inverted from what we hear today. Here's the problem. that They had a, a group called the Gnostics, and the Gnostics believed they had followed the line of Plato, and Plato believed that nothing was ever actually good if it was in the physical form. It was only perfect in the mental form. So do this for me. I want you to imagine a stool. Now, by hearing it, you automatically did it. Now, here's what Plato would say. In your mind, you have just pictured a perfect stool. There's nothing wrong with it. As soon as you make a real one, you're going to have problems, which is true. It's funny, as I picked this up, it rattled because there are screws that are loose on it. His, his mindset, though, was that perfection is found in the mental place, and the moment you put it into the physical, it's no longer perfect. So here was the theory of the Gnostics, that Jesus was never really human, because if he was perfect, he couldn't have been human. So I don't know if they were thinking that Jesus was some sort of holographic image. I don't know what their perspective was on it. But their belief system was that Jesus wasn't really human. He couldn't be God and human. Now, interestingly enough, today it kind of inverts. People know that Jesus existed. We have like verifiable evidence. We have the witness accounts. We know that Jesus existed as a human. They actually challenge now whether or not he was actually God. They believe that he was a person. But was he really God? You know, if I had to say, what's the deceptive philosophy that is attacking us today? It's probably the idea of relativism. The idea is simply this, that truth depends on whatever you believe. Now think of how dangerous this is. Remember the foundation is that Jesus Christ, think about this, Jesus Christ has the power to save us from our sins, and because of his actions, he has not only saved us from our sins, but he begins to transform us and change us. And you flip that around to say, whatever I believe, that's what's true. Well, stop and think about that. In this room, there are some people who believe one thing and some people who believe another. And a relativist just simply says, you believe that, then that's true for you. And you believe that, well, then that's true for you. Well, imagine if someone says, I believe that I can fly. Back in the 90s, that was an actual song. Well, stop and think about that. If someone believes they can fly and then they jump off of a high precipice, what's going to happen? Truth is going to come into play. I don't care what you believe. Gravity is a real issue. So when you say it all depends on what you believe, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Ultimately, here's where it pulls you down. If whatever you believe is what centers truth, what you've essentially done is you said there's a God in the world, and it's me, because I'm the one who picks what's true. And I would say if you're going to follow like that metaphor of the foundation being Jesus, and you're going to build your life on that, this is really the wind that comes in. And if you follow that story from the, that Jesus told that became a song for kids as the wise men built his house upon the rock, and the winds came and the storm came and the house stood firm. I'll tell you, when the deceptive philosophies come in, when you can come back and say, wait, 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 what? Who is it that saves me? It's Jesus Christ. Who is it that holds me fast? It's Jesus. And come back to that foundation. It will hold you in the midst of this. So as we go on, that's the first real caution he's giving to this church in, um, in Colossians. The second one comes from uh, verse 16, and here's what it says. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. Here's an interesting little thing. He's saying, I have a caution for you. If you think that your connection with God is because of the, the religious traditions that you've always done, you are missing the point. 
interestingly enough, all of these things, what you eat and drink, religious festivals, the new moon celebrations and Sabbath, all of these things were things that God used in the Old Testament to help the Jewish people stay centered and connected. They were the avenue to relationship with God. And if you look at Jewish history, this was where a lot of the problem was. They were given this law and they would begin to follow God and then they would get distracted and they would go away from these things that God had called them to. And then God would send someone, uh, a, God would send them a prophet that would say, what are you doing? So if you look at the Old Testament, it's like this ebb and flow where they would follow God and then they get distracted and they would move away from these things. And God said, these things are in place to remind you to follow me. Well, when Jesus comes along, he says, I have replaced this. There's something more important than these. These were the avenue. Now I am the avenue. Don't get caught up in this. And so when Paul's writing to them, he's saying, you may be all about the Sabbath day. And my guess is that most of the people he was talking to probably had a Jewish background, which is why they bent this way. So I want to give you a, a caution here. If deceptive philosophies are a wind, I think sometimes there's something else that happens uh, that tries to attack the foundation. It's that traditions can settle in. And I want to talk with you about some of these. Remember how when, when the Sabbath from the Old Testament was an avenue to remind them to come back to God, come back to, the, to, to their Savior, the one who pulled them out of Egypt, come back to him. Sometimes the avenue becomes more valuable than the actual destination, and that's so dangerous. And I think the same thing is true with traditions. And I want to walk through some traditions of the more modern church. For some of you, this is maybe nostalgic for you. I'm going to walk you through some things that God had used in your life. When I was growing up, I'm going to show you some of those things. One of them is that when I went to church, there were always pews that looked like this. I mean, they, some of them were padded, some weren't. If you were more spiritual, you didn't have the padding because you loved Jesus enough to sit on hard wood. But these people obviously are like Christians light. But they had pews, and this was a part of how churches function. And I don't know if you grew up in this, but they often smelled a certain way. Churches had a certain smell that was only at the church. But you always had pews. Another thing that you'll see is they always, always had a pulpit. I remember when there was this great new invention that allowed them people to move, the pastor to move away from the pulpit. My father was a, a pastor and I saw him, he got this, uh, this, uh, call it, this invention, let's call it an innovation. It was a special microphone that would, instead of it being attached to the pulpit, he could attach it to himself and then he could walk from away from the pulpit and walk over and talk to the people. And I'll tell you, that broke with some tradition and there was some tension about it. But I'll tell you, growing up, the greatest tension that we ever saw around church had to do with these traditions because the tradition became more important than Jesus. The last one, I would say, really centered in on how music was done. Because when I was growing up, music was done where everyone would stand. They would open up a book that was sitting in that pew in front of them. They would pull it out. They would be told a number. They would turn to page number 140, and they would sing that song in a certain way. You would never have a drum set on the stage. You would never have extra instruments. It was a piano and an organ. And when people decided that they wanted to try and start moving other instruments in, it hurt people because they had tied their heart to the avenue that they were moved by. Because they were moved by songs inside this hymnal. Well, what happens when there's a song that's written that's not in that hymnal? Well, what do you do? And one of the things that they started doing, they had this really cool uh, technology, another one of those inventions that really shook people because it shook the tradition. There was a, it's called an overhead projector, and you could put a little cell on top of it or gel on top of it that would have the words projected onto a screen behind. People could look up and they could sing, and it was this amazing thing, and it really rattled people because this is what we've always done. And let me tell you something. In church, that was really like, almost like cuss words. It's like when you say, we've never done it that way before. When you would say something, let's try something different. It was hard, and I'll tell you why. I don't think I really understood this at the time. You know, I was in high school, and I wanted us to have those new songs and that new invention. Um, but what I think was happening was there were people that grew up singing a certain way, and they had felt God move in their heart. And now people were saying, we're going to do it differently. And I'll say that oftentimes when there is something that's a movement, that change often feels like a negative thing. And at the time, I thought that those people who had a different tradition were actually the enemy. What I think that was is they were caught. They were simply trapped, believing that the avenue 
was more valuable than the destination. It was more valuable than Jesus. They had, start to, they, they had started to settle in, not realizing that God had called them to something beyond it. Now, when I look at these, these are all traditions from my growing up. Basically, none of them are a part of family church. But I realized something, that family church has its own traditions. And I want to walk through some of them, and I want to say, for some of you, this may be a challenge because someday the things that you are comfortable with will be gone. In fact, some of you, you have been challenged in your growth over the last year because some of them have been taken away. And what I'm realizing is that so many of us have actually been challenged because what we want was the way it was. And when it can't be that way anymore, we're upset. I want to walk you through a couple of them. The first thing I want you to see is, this is a a picture of the green campus. Obviously, this is pre-COVID because look how many people are there. Also, they're all sitting really close to each other and no one's wearing a mask. But notice something really important here. The pastor is actually preaching. That's Pastor Paul Glazner. And while he is preaching, he is not actually there. Long before COVID, the Green Campus opened in uh, 2013. And when it opened, we made a decision that it would be important for us. We could do more impact if we had one person speaking and speaking to both places. We've had a video sermon given to us about 30 minutes long every single week for the last almost eight years. But what I find so interesting about this is that at some point, we will have to say to ourselves, I don't think this is effective anymore. At some point, we may have to stop and say, this isn't working. We're not going to do this anymore. And I will tell you something, there will be some grieving involved. Now, interestingly enough, for those of us in Green and South Umpqua, we're totally used to this. This is normal for us. Over the last year, I'll speak to those of you who may be from the Sutherland campus, this has been your new reality, and you haven't liked it much. Because your tradition is that there's someone that stands on this stage and communicates with you, and they're in the room with you. In both cases, here's the danger, that the mode of how truth is brought to you becomes more valuable than the truth that's brought. But I'll say this to you, and it's so critical. The foundation is Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose from the dead for our sins. The most important foundation is the gospel. It's not the avenue through which you hear it. So be careful. If your mindset is that this is how things have to be, it won't always be this way. Uh, Another um, thing that I think is just different than any place I've ever— been before it's become a tradition here, is there's a way that we do missions here. And it's different than the way I grew up. We adopt people groups here. We've adopted the crew and the brow, and we're all in on that. It may be that God innovates us to do something different with missions in the future. When I was growing up, we were part of an association of churches where we had a thing called the Lottie Moon Offering. And at the Lottie Moon Offering, every Christmas we would give to it. They had this really great idea called the Cooperative Program where people didn't have to come back after they were on mission trips and come back and get support. They were fully supported. And it it was a genius way to do it. And I remember my grandmother who was a part of it and she had been a missionary on every continent in the world. And when she... uh. She came to live here in Sutherland with us, and she was checking out churches, and she was thinking about whether or not to go to family church. You know what she wanted to know? What is your passion for missions? And then she heard what we did. It was different than the avenue she had lived in before. But she saw it, and she said, I think I see what God's doing there. I'm all for it. Well, someday this may become completely obsolete. And he says to them in Colossians, be careful about your Sabbaths and your new moon festivals. Be careful that the avenue that God had set up isn't necessarily the way he's going to speak to you now. Be careful of the traditions that you put in place. And then also, here's just a great example of what musical worship looks like now. We, we don't have a hymnal that opens up. We have the lights down. We have a cool wood background. We have cool lights and there are people with their hands up. It may be someday that this is totally obsolete and you will look at this and say, man, look what they used to do. Instead, maybe they want lights on and they sit in a circle and they fully, uh, they come around the worship team differently. It may be a very different tradition. I say this so carefully. Be careful not to judge the past and their traditions because you've got your own and it won't be long and God will call you out of those as well. So caution number one, the wind that comes in, be careful, be careful, be careful that you don't get distracted by these deceptive philosophies. But also be careful that you don't settle in with traditions that become more valuable than the gospel foundation itself. There's another one. This comes from uh, verse 23. He talks about the, that 
people set up these ideas like, I'm not going to taste it, I'm not going to touch it. They basically set up a guardrail so far around them that they end up eliminating most of life. And he says, man, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. They don't really change your heart, he says. And for all that effort, all you're doing is just making effort. Caution on this. What is it that saves you? It's Jesus Christ. It's the foundation. And as I look at that, I was thinking, so we have the, the deceptive philosophies and we have the dangers of the traditions, but also I think that there's a danger of regulations. And as we, we were following that, the idea of that the winds of deceptive philosophy and the settling of traditions but I would say there's another um, aspect of this when it comes to this idea of regulations. It's self-imposed worship. It's as though I'm going to earn it. This is a picture of like, if you follow the foundation one, this is like the home improvement guy who thinks because he has a few tools that he can do stuff himself. And so he's going he's gonna to do his own work. Uh, this is my hand because I have that mentality myself. You can tell I was trying to lay some flooring by the way, when cutting the wood, it's best to not be talking to other people. It's best to just look at where the saw is and your hand is. Yeah, I think this is a pretty apt description of when you are in the process of being changed and transformed, it is really, really tempting to think that you can just do it all on your own. Sometimes you just need a professional. And as I was thinking about this, when you're the type of person that sets up the regulation and says, I'm going to do something extra— I'm going to make sure there's an extra lot of, so that I see the sin problem and I'm going to try and solve it. I, I was thinking about this, and I want you to imagine this like in a hypothetical realm. I want you to imagine that someone uh, using a computer gets addicted to uh, online gambling, and in the process of becoming addicted to online gambling, ends up losing a bunch of money, and decides, I am going to stop this. And so he says, I'm never going to websites anymore. Not only am I not going to websites, I'm not going to go to, to computers anymore. So he's, he's starting to put up regulations around him. Not only am I going to uh, avoid computers, I'm not even going to go to tables where people, where there's a computer there. I'm not going to go within five feet of a table that has a computer. Well, what ends up happening is he's trying to do the work that God has uh, for him, but he's trying to do it in his own power. So you end up with false humility because here's what you're thinking, that it's really me that's doing the work. It's really me that's putting it out there. As I was processing this, one of the, the, the places where I think there's a temptation is when you are committed to something and then you see someone else that does it and you say, ah, they're obviously sinning and there's obviously a problem with them. For instance, I've chosen not to be on social media and I see problems on social media, so here can be the temptation. Because I've chosen to put a guardrail around social media, you must be sinning if you're on social media. Or you must be sinning if you're using a computer. You see how this works? And then maybe the worst thing is, is the good news of Jesus no longer becomes the good news because it's not saving me. I'm trying to do it on my own. And I'll tell you, it'll never, ever work. So how do we solve this? Well, the beauty of this is that Colossians 2, throughout the entire chapter, continues to come back to what saves us. And it's that foundation. Here's what it says in, in verse, uh, starts in verse 12. And it's actually throughout the entire chapter. And I'd love it this week in your devotions, you're going to be challenged to read through the chapter very slowly, answering some questions. I really want you to look for where the gospel pop, pops out. Here's what it says. Having been buried with him in baptism. So this idea that Jesus Christ died for our sins and was buried. And we are buried with him. In which you were also raised with, raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. And having canceled the ch uh, charge of our legal indebtedness because of our sins, he, he has um, canceled that charge, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. I love that last part. Imagine that there's something written up against you about all the things that you've done, and they took it and they nailed it to the cross. And I want to walk through what this means, just simple terms of the gospel. The first is that you were, that you were buried. That I walked, and I, in my life, I was moving along in my sinful way, and when I came into a relationship with Jesus, I joined him in his death. 
and I join him in his new life because the story of Jesus is that he lived a perfect life and then died for our sins and then rose again. Well, I did not live a perfect life, but I got to join him in his death, though not having to die myself. He paid the price, and then I was raised from the dead. This is what he said, that raised with him. And then finally, it, it also says that we are forgiven. And as I was thinking of this, I think this is a hard concept to come around. It's the idea that someone else paid the price, and so because Jesus Christ paid the price for me, I get to live in forgiveness. Probably the, the best example in my life of helping me understand this was when I got, was a kid's pastor, and I got to walk through this with kids. I'll tell you, if you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, one of the best things you can do is work with kids, because as you are walking it through with them, it becomes a marker for you. One Easter, we did something uh, special and fun. As the fifth and sixth graders were coming into class, all of them had to sign in, and they would sign their name. And then we had an extra piece of paper that day. And they didn't really read it really carefully, which is exactly what we knew they would do. And so they didn't ask us any questions. They just signed their name. Well, on the piece of paper, we made it look like a legal document. We put, like, the Oregon seal on it. And then at the bottom, we gave put really small little fine print. So every one of the kids signed it. But at the bottom, in really fine print, it said, if you have done anything wrong this year, if you have sinned at all, you are subject to corporal punishment. For those of you that don't know what corporal punishment is, it's basically a spanking. And uh, they agreed to it. So this is great. Every kid comes in. They sign it. They sit down. We tell them the story of Jesus Christ. We tell them this simple story that all of us are sinners, but Jesus lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and then rose from the dead because all of us are sinful. If we choose to believe him, he will mark us as paid. Remember that? Canceling our indebtedness, nailing it to the cross. We told them that story. And then we said, line up over here. We're going to give you your spanking. Happy Easter. And they were like, what are you talking about? I'm not getting spanked. And I said, uh, yeah, you are. And they said, no, we're not. You can't spank us. And I said, is this your signature? And they said, yeah, you signed it. This says, it says right here on the bottom, if you've committed any sin in the last year, corporal punishment, that's a spanking. It's fun when you say that that way to, to fifth and sixth graders because they know you're messing with them, but they're kind of thinking, oh my goodness, what is he going to do? And I said, is this your signature? Have you sinned? Yes, they all agreed. I said, line up. And they said, wait a minute, I don't want to do this. And I said, I know. And then we went back to the story of Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ was in a similar position where everyone deserved death. And so the only right thing to do is to line everybody up and say, you all deserve death because the price for sin is death. And then we said, because we wanted them to, to, to picture this image of Jesus Christ taking it on for them, we said, okay, I'll take the spanking for you. Someone has to pay the price. And so what we had done is I had a friend of mine who was uh, helping me out in kids' ministry. His name was Jeff. And like, I'm a wee little man. Jeff was not. And I said, Jeff, can you make us a paddle? And then you spank me so that I paid the price for what their mistakes. And, and he was like, yeah, I can build a paddle. Well, little did I know that Jeff was going to go all out on it. He put 12 holes in it so that there wouldn't be as much wind resistance so he could spank me harder. And, and I, one of the things that I'd said to him is like, when we do this, this can't be like a little, like, little, <laughs> it had to be real. And so I was like, oh my goodness. He walked in with that thing and I was like, I am going to pay the price for this. And so the kids— Instead of lining up, they said, okay, Pastor Will, you're going to pay the price. And so I bent over, and I'm telling you, I just learned to walk again because he hit me so hard, I felt like I was going to break a bone. I can neither confirm nor deny, but tears may have sprung from my eyes, and all the kids cheered, and I was like, are you kidding me? It hurt so bad. But here's what we did with him after that. Every one of them got their paper back with their signature that agreed that they deserved it. But then when they walked through, we had a little stamp that just said, paid. Isn't this the essence of the gospel? I did not deserve to take that punishment for them. But Jesus didn't deserve to take the punishment he did either. And it was funny. I don't know if any kid remembers that day, but it's been helpful for me to remember the gospel because the ultimate part of the gospel is it leads to this. And this one, this part isn't in Colossians. It doesn't use this word, but I want us to, to, to I want you to hold this. And it's the idea of reconciliation. Because that idea of, of my sins and that Jesus had to die for my sins, what we often forget is that because of that, because of those sins, I can't be connected to him. And when Jesus died on the cross, he made a way. He made a way where there was no way. 
where me and my sin can link up with God and his perfection, and we can be reconciled because of the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross. What an amazing gift. You know, this gospel idea of, of this being buried, our death, being raised with him, being forgiven and being reconciled. Here's the myth that we often buy into. We believe that it's for the seeker to become a student. Pastor Paul brought this up last week, this spiritual pathway, and Jason the week before. We think that this is where the gospel goes. I actually would, would put out there that I think it's actually every single part of this, that what moves us from a servant to a steward and from a student to a servant is when we come to a greater understanding of that gospel and we buy into it and we say, this is what changes me. Uh, I told you the, at the beginning the story of Pastor Ed and what happened with his foundation. You know it cost them two months of building time for them to get the right contractors out there and take care of the problem? Two months. And then after that, every single schedule was off. It delayed them far longer than just even their initial two months. But you know the most important part of that story wasn't what was wrong with this foundation right here. It was what was going on with this guy right here and the guy in the excavator. You see, Ed made a commitment that whatever happened with this house, with these sticks and with this concrete, it was irrelevant in comparison to the example he was going to be for those people who were watching. And here's what he said. He matters more than the home. And so Ed walked with grace. And when he would come in, he would tell the stories to us in staff meetings. I was mad on, on Ed's behalf. And Ed very calmly would talk about, but the people matter more. So when there were the moments when Ed felt frustration, he knew this was more important than the foundation. This guy matters more than the stuff. You know what I was seeing there? That the foundation really is important. And I don't mean this foundation. I mean the foundation of the gospel. I got to watch the gospel play out inside Ed's heart. And I'll tell you, there's one thing for your mentor to tell you stuff. And Ed's told me a lot of great information. I wonder if over that year in 2016, watching Pastor Ed walk through it, if the greater impact he's had on me was that I got to watch him live like a follower of Jesus and point people to the gospel. We have a challenge for you this week, and we wanna, we're going to release to each of the campuses, uh, and I'm going to release to Jason for the online people. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jason. I'm the South Amqua campus pastor. And whether you're in our online campus or in a home church in South Amqua, I'm just grateful that you're here to be a part of this journey with us as we go through the book of Colossians. And today, we really want to leave you with a challenge uh, to preach the gospel to yourself every day this week. And I would really add to that Every day, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves multiple times because one of the biggest enemies to living out the gospel in our life is forgetfulness. We forget that Jesus really lived the perfect life that I can't live, that he really died in my place as the atoning sacrifice for my sins, and that he really rose again, and that in these truths, I can find freedom, I can find power over sin, and I can truly live out this identity that is my inheritance in the gospel. Um, so that's our challenge for you today. And we, we also wanted to just take a moment. If you have ever been to one of our physical campuses before, sometimes we do what is called a family moment. Um, as we're doing life together, difficult things can arise to the surface. And we want to take a moment to just address those things. So we're gonna have a little family moment here. It is no secret that over the last several months, even over the last year, that there has been lots of division in our culture, in America, and unfortunately, even within the church. That is a reality that we are living in. And um, I wanted to share just that some of Jesus' words and his heart for us. In John 17, it's called the high priestly prayer. And towards the end of his prayer, he actually prays for you and I. And here's what he says. As he's praying to his father, he says, I do not ask only for these, those people who are with him, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. He, the people who will believe as a result of their testimony. That's us. And that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. You know what he prays for? He prays for unity. He says, just as the Son and the Father are unified, I want my people, I want the church to be unified. And he says, he goes on, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You know what he's saying? What unites us is so much greater than what divides us. And when there's division in the church, it is easy to forget the mission of God. But he equates this unity with letting the world know that a Savior came in Jesus. 
So I want to remind us and I want to call us back to unity. We don't, we don't have to all agree. Unity is not unanimity. It's not that everybody agrees on the exact same thing. But unity says, at the foundation of my life, Jesus is the core. And because of that, we are reconciled. We can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ who may have different perspectives, but we are on mission and a mission that is greater than any political agenda or greater than any, than any, any uh, tradition of man. This is, this is the mission of God. That's what I want to call us back to today. So I want to challenge you in addition to the, the sermon this week. Uh, where do you need unity? What, 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 what people do you need to begin seeing through the eyes of Christ as image bearers, as, as people who Christ indwells, as people who God loves, and even if they don't agree with you? I want to pray for us. Lord Jesus, I, I just, I echo your prayer, God. Uh, I, I I couldn't have said anything better. That, that this unity that you call for, for your church, it's to be reflect a reflection of the unity that is in the Godhead. And I pray, God, that that would be a reality at Family Church, that that would be a reality at the churches in Douglas County, that would be a reality at the churches in America, and that that would be the reality in the churches across the globe. That we wouldn't get distracted from the mission because of division, over whatever issue, but we would remember the mission of God still goes forth. The gospel still goes forth, even amidst this uncertain times, God. I pray for unity in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you next week.